you notice that. But we uh, are. If we start talking about politics, we don't finish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, just had <laughs> we just had elections in Peru last Sunday. Yeah. 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 Yes, you're right. Very close. <laughs> Very close. Yeah, so tight. So tight. I didn't like what happened. I have to tell oh. you. <laughs> well, gentlemen, 30 minutes to go. Uh, 30 seconds to go, sorry. 30, 30 seconds. seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 so, Julia, I'll give a short intro and then. Oh, Mike. You can start your presentation. Okay. Oh, Boss Andrew's here. Okay, it's nine o'clock, Mike. Hello. Go. Okay. Good evening, Asia. On behalf of Victor Yu in Taipei, Andrew Sebastian in Kuala Lumpur, I'm Mike Lu in Manila. Welcome to episode 15 of Beyond Birding here on the Asian Bird Fair online talk. Uh, this is our second to the last episode for this series, and we have a special guest. We are taking you all the way to Central America to meet Senor Julio Acosta of El Salvador Birds. Julio, como estás? Muy bien, muy bien, Mike. It's a pleasure to, to be here, and I want to to thank you personally for the for the invitation. Um, I remember when we met in um, in the Colombia Bear Fair, when the South American Bear Fair, that uh, we kind of talk about birding in, in Central America. So it's going to be a pleasure to to share all the experience and, and how um, encouraging. Uh, conservation through birding has worked so well for me here and not only for me but also for the country for the ecosystems and for the birds themselves yeah, we're all excited to hear what you are doing over there in el salvador so the floor you. is yours <laughs> well i will start uh, sharing here okay there we go can you see it yes 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 great okay well, um, first, first of all, I, I want to introduce uh, myself a little bit. Uh, I'm Julia Costa. I'm a national tour guide for, for El Salvador um, since 2006. And um, for years and years, I was um, specialized in archaeology, history, coffee, in all the topics related to tourism. I had a little experience about uh, biodiversity and, uh, you know, because of the basic training we got. But in 2016, 2015, actually, is when I decided to specialize uh, in birding in, in the country. And for that, I started reading a lot. And then I started going to, to the field, revisiting my national parks, our national parks, seeing the birds in, front, in walking those trails with another perspective, with another a pair of eyes, you know, a new pair of eyes in, in, in this case. So in El Salvador, let's start by, let's see. Okay. So where's El Salvador? Well, it's exactly in the middle of America, you know. Um, you see, it's the smallest country in Central America. It's 20,700 square kilometers. Uh, comparing size in the world with uh, New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, the, it's a little smaller than the Timor Island in, in South Asia, and uh, almost exactly the same, the same size of Wales in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is our, our territory, and uh, it's mostly volcanic. We are in the ring of fire. And well, Salvador is very uh, particular. It's, uh, it's a lovely place. We, we do have a lot uh, talking about geography, talking about the ecosystems. We are part of the dry forest corridor of Mesoamerica, which is a belt, an area that we have dry forests in the Pacific Ocean that starts in Mexico and finishes in Costa Rica. But we also have cloud forest we also have amazing uh, wetlands and uh, mountains. And the population of the country is around 6 million people. 
and from those six million people, and there, there was a lot of migration to the United States in the in the 80s um, due to our civil war that we had back then. So in, in the States, we have three million people uh, just living in the States. And the country, it's, uh, as I told you, uh, it has uh, 14 provinces, it has 14 main cities, and the country, it's very easy to move in because the infrastructure is, is just amazing. And uh, we call it the 90 minute country because in 90 minutes we're almost everywhere in the country. Well, we're going to come back to, to the country and talking about the geography ecosystems a little later. Now we go through a um, little history and um, burden in El Salvador. Well, burden in El Salvador, it's something new. Um, from the sense that burning as a um, spur time activity, because burning in El Salvador, of course, started with investigations in the 19th century. We have these scientists coming to our territory um, in those steam boats, uh, usually that were British boats, and they started doing investigations. You see, for example, Adolf Lesson that discovered here or oh, found here, not discovered, but found here the Momotus Lessoni, which is the Lessons Mudmut, and Orbert Salvin that discovered the wild or nav cache in one of the in our volcanoes. Um, that was back then in the 19th century. Before then, there were a lot of Spanish. Do you remember that we are we were a Spanish colony, so we were a lot of Spanish. Uh, people that were walking around and reporting some uh, some birds, but nothing like scientific. Then coming to the 20th century is when burden and the investigation of birds in El Salvador starts. It's a little bit more serious. And this is uh, the uh, American Dutch ornithologist, Joseph Van Rosen that came to, to El Salvador. And he probably did uh, one of the the second most important investigation about birds in El Salvador. He discovered in those years around 225 species. And he finally finished this, uh, published these books, The Birds of El Salvador, that is from the 40s, thanks to Donald Dickey. And most of the specimens that he collected are in a museum in, in California. And, and then we have uh, Melvin Trailer that came in the 50s and he published the Manual de las Aves del Salvador, and that's from uh, 1954. Then we have Walter Torber in the 70s, 80s. And he, he, he did a lot of recordings and, and there's a lot of files in, in, in museums and in some uh, digital libraries that most of the recordings of Walter Torber of the birds of El Salvador, the first time that somebody was recording them. And he published Cien Aves del Salvador in uh, around 79, if I'm wrong. And finally, we have Dr. Oliver Comer that came in the 90s and he started um, as a part of the doctorate and studying the birds of El Salvador. He stayed here for, for a long time. And he is the one that investigated the birds of El Salvador in the, in the best way, let's say. And he finally, in 2003, published this Lista de Aves del Salvador. And he, he is also author of the Peterson uh, Guide of Birds of Northern Central America, which is the, the guide that you can use to come bird in here. So as you can see through this point, most of the um, birding in El Salvador was, were not actually Burden in the um, like uh, you know like a hobby. It was more like an yeah, investigation. And uh, Dr. Oliver Comar started stay and started a program with this uh, institution, Salvanatura, and they established here a banding station, a banding station uh, to check migratory birds. And the birders in this period were mostly students of biology. Most of the students of biology that were in the National University were actually recruited by Oliver Comer and started doing these programs. And he's the one that started the birthathons, the marathons of birds from 2003 to 2011. 
And in 2013 is the, the first time a group of people actually organized and established the first uh, burning club. And now we're, now we're talking about people doing this for hobby for the first time. There were a couple of biologists included there in the group, but most of the people were uh, not really scientific and they started the, doing some burden in, in the surroundings of a town called Suchitoto. I will show you the, the town later. So, so far until this point, um, very limited quantities of people had access to these or were interested in burden or in the birth of the country. Uh, in 2015, as I told you, I started, um, you know, doing all my research, studying my books, and going back to my, my trainings uh, as a tour guide. And then in 2016, I started guiding. This is actually, this is a picture of my first burden, burden tour. This is a couple of British people. We have this amazing Bicentenario Park very near the city. It's actually less than five minutes by car. And uh, it has an um, amazing quantity of birds. To be so close to the city to have 170 species reported is, is very big. So, and I started doing more birding around the country. This is in the Imposible National Park, an amazing park that we have in the, in the West. This is El Jocotal Lagoon, which is a, a floating lagoon, which is, gets packed with migratory birds, in, especially in the migratory season. These are part of the wetlands in the in the east. Uh, this is uh, actually Chris Fisher, who was doing in that back then a uh, big Central American year. And I think when we were doing this, he he was about 900 birds that year, and he ended up having like a south and a south and 30, a south and 40 at the end of the year. And uh, this is in Los Volcanes National Park, even though it was kind of uh, cloudy there, you cannot see the volcanoes. I'll show you to later. So in this point, I realized something uh, when I was doing my, my own investigation and revisiting my national parks and talking to people. People look really, the locals especially, were looking really weird at me. So what is this guy doing? Is he going to try doing something bad here in the community? What is he doing with uh, binoculars? And what, why is he with you know wearing green? He's a soldier or, or what is it? So, I was getting a lot of questions and, and a lot of people getting close that were not really trusting me in my presence in the, in, the, in the territories. And then I started talking. And this is the moment when I realized uh, for me, the, the task was not going to be just simply guiding, just simply going to the territories, but it was also education. And in this moment is I, I realized I had to talk to the people I had to find out who were um, actually interested because in, in the scientific period that I was describing before, some locals were joining the scientists and were actually walking. So I have to find, I have to find out which were these people. And uh, actually I was able to, to contact them and talk to them and then continue continue, uh, let's say their informal training about this. So, um, and at that point, I realized something really important that local guides, local guides were so important. And I can, I can I show you three examples here um, in, in, the, in the first picture that we see here in, La, in El Jocotala, when we have Herson and Herbert, these are two local fishermen and they were so interested in fishing, but were not really interested in birds. But when I was getting there and I was uh, hiring them to take me in their canoes, you cannot use uh, uh, engine boats here, just canoes. Uh, it's, a, it's a reserve. It's actually a Ramsar site. It's so important, which is a Ramsar site. So now these people are almost experts in, in their avifauna there. And uh, they know the, the birds have uh, represent income for them in the sense that Tourists will start getting, and this is, for example, Lawrence. Lawrence from last year, just before lockdown, we we did an amazing seven-day tour with this gentleman from uh, North Carolina. And the second picture we have Victor, which is uh, and now he's an expert. He's an amazing local guide, which is um, 
amazingly he he has um a lot of people from the community has joined him and going around the trails in Los Volcanes National Park, which is an amazing place to, to see cloud, cloud forest species. And finally, in the right, we have Rafael. And Rafael, it's 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 very unique um, case because in the 70s, he joined the guerrillas. He was a, a guerrilla fighter. And he was fighting in, during the Civil War. He made it through the war and he became a keeper in, in one of the natural areas in central El Salvador. And he, when he retired from being a keeper in, this, in that area, he talked to me, says, Julio, uh, I want to do birding. You know, I've been seeing you doing it and now I want to be a birder. And now every time we go there to, with tourists or even when I go by myself, I hire him and we go so it, it, it's, it's very unique. Um, and he knows so well the territory because he was fighting there with, uh, as a guerrilla member. And, and now he's specializing not only in the territory, but in, in birds. So I realized these things and, and I know how important um, this part of the burden chain is. And then I started with education. And um, I started contacting teachers in some territories. I started contacting uh, leaders and communities and uh, trying to motivate them to, to do some burden to join me or even to do some campaigns. You can see me here with a group of kids from San Salvador, we're in Bicentenario Park and, and some of the kids were just amazed of, of the quantity of birds they saw that morning. I, Thanks to lockdown, I've been doing you know a lot of Zoom trainings. This is a group of scouts um, where completely locked down, and, and the leader of their troop contacted me and says, you know, I want you to to do some training for my boys. And I think there were like around 25, 30 of, of the scouts of that troop there that afternoon um, doing a training with all adults. And um, in this case, where I'm with. Um, university students and um, uh, training them on the use of the Eber app, yeah, and uh, how to collect the information and how to use the app and while they're going around. Um, and this is a group of teenagers and we are in uh, another area in the east of the country. This group of teenagers was very, very particular because the boys there used to use the, the slingshots to to play, to play with with the birds, and it was so hard to to tell them, you know, you don't have to do that because there's consequences, and you need that um, education and training to not continue doing that. Uh, training use using the app with uh, university students again, and then this comes to my. Twitter account, as I was telling you, then my my Twitter account for me is um, well. At the beginning, it was just you know, oh, I want to show the world about the birds, and I was you know posting in in English and my the pictures of the specialties we have here. But then I realized this was a tool for me. This is it was a tool, and then I started teaching them and and posting and talking to the people and. Little by little, more followers were joining in. And then in this account, I talked to them about, for example, species that we have in the country. Why are they special? Why are they important? Where they can find them? If they are common, if they are rare? This is a belted uh, flycatcher, which is um, almost endemic to, to the country. We don't have true endemics in the country. We have regional endemics, North and Central American endemics. I talked to them about problems that we have in, in wildfires and how are they produced, how responsible as human beings we are of these problems. And uh, thanks to, to these campaigns, for example, in this particular park, uh, we have this sad picture of an anteater that was born in a wildfire. There was no fires this year in this park. Uh, thanks to the campaign of telling the people, you know, you have to be more responsible with the use of fires, et cetera. 
And also when I when I go birding, even if I go by myself or with tourists, I talk to them about these areas that are spatial to see birds, the species we can find there. In this case, it's, it's, it's the forest of Northern East El Salvador, which is an amazing area for, for birds. And in 2018, uh, Dr. Oliver Comer, which was not uh, anymore here, but it's a coordinator of Eber Central America, asked me, well, ask six Central American people to coordinate efforts in Central America to promote birding and to promote uh, particularly this event that you all know, in this case, it's a global big day. And now uh, since 2018, um, I am the coordinator of Global Big Day in El Salvador. And uh, when I when we started in 2018, this was our collage. You see, you can count this. I think we were like a total of 18 people in Global Big Day in 2018. And, but then it was growing in 2019, we were like 30. And then during lockdown, we, in 2020, we reached uh, like around 65 people, even though we're all, all by ourselves just talking. And this is the, uh, just recently in 2021, just weeks ago, we achieved a quantity of 212 people burning. Um, it's a considerable difference from the, the first year I started promoting the event. Now people want to be part, people want to, it's excited about, you know, going to the territories, finding the birds, knowing more about it. And of course, all this has the consequence of conservation of the species, conservation of the ecosystems. Um, we design uh, some little guides for them of good practices for birding and how to preserve the habitats. And we were doing trainings online for all these people. And the result was that in, in on Global Big Day, we achieved the quantity of 318 species that we observe from a total of around 400 that we have in May in, in the country, because most of the migratory birds are gone to North America. And well, this is um, how the global big day has, in the October big days in this case too, have developed in the quantity of birders that we have um, motivated through these events and through the campaigns uh, on social networks on, or going to the communities and motivating to, to do or participate in this event and other events um, we have short bird counts, we have the Christmas counts, some of them, in, we have like around four Christmas counts in the country now, and people is really motivated to, to this. The lockdown, as I, was, as I was telling before, lockdown has been amazing for, for this process. People being locked down in their houses, asking and seeing for the first time that they have birds in their, in their gardens, that they have, and they, I was, I was floated with pictures of, of birds in, from all over the country. I, I told my followers I was never locked down because you sent me so many pictures of all over the country that I was there with you watching those birds. And, and it was amazing to see the response of people. We were doing virtual observations with them and people were sending pictures, videos, etc. cetera. Well, um, coming back to, to the country, coming back to, to El Salvador, um, it's just an amazing territory. We have particular areas. We have the Pacific Coast, for example. We have this area, Barra de Santiago, which is an amazing place. It's, it's one of the largest mangrove systems that we have in Central America. Um, you can spot, and, and this is a nesting place, for example, for American oyster catcher in, um, it's been, uh, Problems to protect the, the nesting of this species there. This is also the place for yellow nape parrots. I will show you those species later. Yellow nape parrots are in danger now in Northern Central America. And there's a very serious problem with conservation. And this is an area that yellow nape parrots nest. We have Hikilisco Bay, which is another amazing 
a mangrove system. And finally, we have Fonseca Golf or, or Golfo de Fonseca. This is a golf that we share with Honduras and Nicaragua. These are the islands of El Salvador, and this is an amazing place for shorebirds. Um, recently, a lot of investigations have discovered that this is a key place, a key place for migration of shorebirds. And there's a lot of census and investigations on this matter in the Gulf. Related to Barra de Santiago, we have El Imposible National Park, which is a, a tropical dry forest. A, it's very, very, it's one of the largest in the country. And also we have the Ramsar site, which is a floating, floating lagoon, is Laguna El Jocotal or El Jocotal Lagoon. These five places are key hotspots for a burden and also for conservation. What kind of species we can, we can spot in this area of the country? Well, as I told you before, American oyster cashew, you see the, the young one there behind uh, the adult. Um, I was, I have been lucky to, to find ring, uh, also ring uh, banded oyster catchers there coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Rufus pressed the spine tail. This is uh, from the bushes there near the, sorry, near the Barra de Santiago in the ages of the mangrove forest. It's, it's, it's very complicated to see, it's easier to, to hear. But if you're patient enough, you can, you can, you can just, I have just gotten one picture. It, that's not mine, by the way, but it's very nice. Uh, the yellow wing cacique, we have this um, bird. We have a isolated colony in the coast of El Salvador. Most of their, the range of this, of this bird is in Mexico, but we have one isolated colony that the people suspect now can be uh, a different species. There's a slightly differences with the one in Mexico. The Rudy Craig, which is, is a Central American uh, specialty from the wetlands, from the mangroves. The Trogons, uh, in the dry forest of the Imposible National Park, we have this elegant, beautiful, elegant Trogon. Um, it's um, if you're patient enough, you can spot it, and the male is, is just beautiful. Um, the bear throated tiger heron. This is a very secretive um, uh, species, but in the salt salt facilities, salt production facilities, it's kind of easy to spot them. It's, uh, when they are juveniles, they have an amazing tiger pattern in their plumage. Uh, the yellow nay parrot, as I was telling you, this is an, an endangered parrot. And for hundreds of years, people have made them pets here. And um, we have something very particular with this species. Um, apparently, long, long time ago, couples of pets escaped in San Salvador city, in the capital. And now the capital city is full of these birds. You can spot them in malls, you can spot them in places that you will never imagine you'll see an endangered species. Um, and well, actually that's, that's good because they have completely adapted to the urban areas in Salvador in numbers, even though the species is danger, in San Salvador, numbers appear to be growing and uh, citizen science is very important with this. And uh, Eber has done a lot of uh, work. Now, if you look information on this species on Eber has limited information there they will not show uh locations they will just show dates and approximate locations but not exact locations uh the fonseca rail this is a subspecies of mangrove rail that happens only in the fonseca gulf um people is treating it approximately possibly as a, as a new species the black-headed trogon another trogon here in the in the coast the white belly shashalaca, which is an endemic species, just happens from Chiapas in Mexico to Honduras in the Pacific coast. It's a very small range. And our national bird, even though it's not an endemic, the turquoise brow mama, this is our national bird. And if we go a little higher in altitude, we go to the volcanic chain. You can see these particular, if you see the, the the mouse here, this area here are the volcanoes. All these are volcanic chain, including the islands here in the Gulf. 
So in these areas, we can find, for example, the Apaneca mountain range, which is our extinct volcanoes. We have those Volcanes National Park with an amazing volcano there. This is the second youngest volcano in Central America, the Salco volcano. Um, and we all, in the east, we have this uh, El Sapo River Basin, which is amazing place. This, this area of mountains in the middle of the, of the country are just amazing areas for species like the bushy crested jay, which is an endemic species. Um, the rufous saber wing is uh, the hummingbirds in this area are very, very special and a lot of them are endemics. This is one of them, the rufous saber wing. The white-faced ground sparrow, this is almost a specialty of coffee plantations. He loved to be in, in, in secondary forests from coffee plantations. The Pacific parakeet, it is another example of an endemic species which is very well adapted to, to urban spaces. You can find this in, in all the area in San Salvador city. You can find it in neighborhoods. Uh, the green threaded mountain gem, which is a cloud forest specialty. The bar wind oriole, this is also an oriole that loves to be in, in coffee plantations, in those secondary forests from coffee plantations. The watermelon tyrannulate, this is from wet forest, this is a little lower than, than the rest, but loves to be in cloud forest. This is a very hard to see uh, species, it's easier to, to hear. Uh, and we have the slender shear tail, which this is an amazing species of uh, hummingbird. And again, it's very difficult to see, it's very discreet, secretive. You, you need to be in the right place in the right moment. And most of the time it's luck when you can spot them. The blue and white mockingbird, this is one of the best singers in, in the country, amazing singer, has a wide range of songs and it's, it's a delight to hear and to see, of course, in the, in the cloud forest. Now, if we go to, to the north, to, to the border with Honduras, which is the north, we find this primary forest with Parque National Park Monte Cristo in the area of El Pital and Miramundo. These are mountains that are higher than 2,000 meters above sea level, which means we have completely different range of species here. And in the case of Monte Cristo National Park, this is a protected area and there's barely no people around just the keepers. In the case of El Pital and Miramundo, it's an area which has a lot of agriculture, a lot of tourism, a lot of activities, but it has preserved some of these forests and birds stay there. In this area, we can find the amazing garnet throated hummingbird, which is a, a, a delight for photographers. A lot of people uh, love to photograph because of the variety of colors that the hummingbird has. The rufous color robin, which is an endemic species from the mountains. The unspotted sawed owl, owl it's, um, this is a very uh, beautiful small owl. Um, and there's a lot of places here in the mountains that you can, you can find it. And uh, it's, it's, it's very cute, it's very nice. It's not so hard to see. Once you hear, you can easily uh, spot it. The Azure Crown Hummingbird, this is another specialty from these, these mountains here in the north. The Black Throated Jay, that's another endemic from, from North and Central America, very beautiful Jay. It's a little secretive as, as well. And uh, the Blue Throated Mammoth, this is uh, very easy to spot, in, especially in, in, by this time from February to May, it's, it's absolutely easy to spot the rest of them of the year when it's nesting is a little complicated because it nests in, in holes in the walls and it stays there and never moves, barely moves from those. But it's a very beautiful and photogenical uh, species. The Highland one, uh, he loves, to, this species loves to be in the mountains and move around. It's, it's, it's very noisy and beautiful. And the amazing wine threaded hummingbird, this is, not complicated to see, it's very small. It's uh, the second smallest hummingbird from the country. And once you know the spot and you know which of the plants, just, just sit there and you have the light. This is the male 
it has this uh, very beautiful wine color beer. And uh, it's a delight to see. And uh, most of the time when I see it, I forget I have a camera. I just prefer to stay with the binoculars uh, because it just, I don't want to waste my time trying to photograph. Just enjoy the beauty of the, of the bird. Well, as I told you, um, the world still doesn't look at Salvador as a birding destination. And we do have neighbors that are very famous for it, especially Costa Rica, which started long ago a program of, of ecotourism. And now, now we have Honduras, which is, uh, five years ago started very hard promoting their country. Guatemala and El Salvador still uh, these, these two territories that are people doesn't really necessarily look as during destinations, but the, the country, uh, it's, it's just amazing for do some uh, birding. You can see here, for example, this is a road map and all are these paved uh, roads in the country. You can move in, in from east, from west to east in the country in seven hours from north to south in around four hours. Uh, with very nice connections, connectivity. You can be in Los Volcanes National Park at 7 a.m. birding and looking at uh, hummingbirds. And then at 3 p.m. you can be in Barra de Santiago with, um, on a boat with a, with a cold beer and watching the, the birds here in the, in the estuaries. Or you can be in, in the east, you can be in Laguna del Jocotal at 7 a.m. And at 3 p.m. you can be in the forest of the El Sapo River Basin. Um, this easiness of, of moving there in the country makes it so simple to go around and bird. One thing that it's very important to point is that a country is the hub for one of the main airlines in, in America. And, and this is Avianca. All the flights coming from North America going to South America or otherwise going to South America, from South America to North America stop here in the country. And uh, they do layovers of minutes, hours, or days. Our authorities have designed a program that you can actually stay up to 48 hours in, in the territory doing a layover. Uh, with no exit taxes from the airport. So a lot of people um, have decided to come, do the stop, but stay in the airport. And I can tell you because I, I see the, their eager list. I see a lot of tourists staying inside the airport, but some of them, they have decided to go out and take a look and do explorations. And um, in these two cases, this these gentlemen were just for hours there. I just picked them in the morning at the airport and then in the evening, just before their flights, they were in time for their flights and we had amazing time. And the first one here is uh, Dorian Anderson, which we saw a lot around in eight hours, we saw like 150 species. And with Adam in the ride, I think we have, we saw like around 110 species in the places he chose to, to take a look. And uh, well, layovers is one of the possibilities, but also um, this is the base experience that I, I offer in, in El Salvador uh, as birding. With one week of, of birding, you just go through all these spots trying to cover the North and Central America endemics. Uh, we have amazing infrastructure. We have nice places to stay. And it's actually very easy to do one of these uh, kind of circuits. Um, it's just like we need to let the people around the world know that this is a destination. And uh, of course, this will help us. Oh, well, with this gentleman, Lawrence, we started here in the ocean. This is in, in the east. Then we went to El Hopotal Lagoon. Then we went to a crater, a volcanic crater. This is a, a lagoon you can see in the background. This is completely sulfuric. We were inside a crater, non-active volcano, and we were watching all kinds of species. And finally, we made it to El Pital, which is the highest point of, of the country. And uh, with this gentleman, in I think it was like six days with him, and we saw around 240 species. Um, including all the endemics that we saw in, in that quantity of days. So um, 
the idea is um, to let people know around the world that we are a burning destination, that people can come to El Salvador and help us with the conservation through burning. I've seen a lot of changes in communities, a lot of changes in the mind of followers in Twitter, people caring more about the species, caring more about the, the ecosystems. And of course, I, I intend to continue with this permanent campaign this particular week in, in my Twitter account, I'm, I'm talking about flycatchers. And uh, a lot of people were let's say, oh, wow, we have that bird here in El Salvador. And says, yeah, well, you know, we have it here. Uh, in this permanent, permanent campaign of education uh, that I intend to continue, I know it, it's not really what I, what I do as a tour guide, but I think it's a perfect complement of doing it to encourage conservation through birding in El Salvador. So thank you. And, um, it's been a pleasure to share all this with, with you. And um, I would really love to um, get any questions you may have, guys, uh, about this. I will um, stop sharing the presentation now. Thank you very much, Julio. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. It seems that uh, birding tourism is a new business in El Salvador, is it? Yes, yes it is. Uh, as I told you in the, in the history of this, this was an activity most dedicated for scientific purposes. But just recently, some people have gotten interested in, uh, besides the local guides, we have some other guys that are doing this, but it's not a lot of people that are see these as as business yet and in my case i don't actually see it like that but i i see it as a way well i started with that perspective but then my mind completely changed after going through the country and uh, finding out that it's more than that it's not only that it's an effort to do conservation of ecosystems and the species what what, what about your government does your government support birding tourism if yes, then how do they support? Well, uh, you know, there's little organization still about the, the, the burden and uh, it's mostly personal, personal efforts, right? And um, the, the point here is that once this is started, once this starts as a, as a big thing, it will probably encourage more people. And uh, authorities have just recently gotten interested. For example, I had a, a tour with the Ministry of, of Tourism oh. just in March. Just in March. And um, these people are saying, you know, uh, I want to know more about your work. I want to, you know, go out with you and, and, and know more about what you're doing. But it was just last March. And uh, I've been doing this for, my, for five years. But um, I have a lot of expectations that um, people will try to understand, authorities will try to understand more about it and then encourage an investment from, from the authorities in this matter. And of course, the main purpose of all this will be the development of, of people, communities, uh, in order to promote conservation practice. Fantastic. Uh very good opportunity you know for for you to develop the spring tourism in El Salvador it's great yeah it's a it's a process it's a process and uh, and um I've been really patient as well my wife especially being really patient uh, with me <laughs> and uh my you know my uh, danger of doing this and uh, but it's 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 worth I I know now that it, it is worth I, I see changes and I hope to, to bring more development to this. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, any question for Julio? El Salvador seems like a great country. Yes, Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, we have uh, several questions. Oh, yeah, uh, but the first one is how safe it is now? There's still go gorillas in El Salvador or not? <laughs> well, Thank you, Francisco. This is a, this is a very uh, common question I was getting in, not only as a birding guy, but as a tour guy in general, uh, I remember 
receiving people in the, in the airport and asking the same questions. Are we going to see gorillas today? And well, the Civil War ended in 92, and um, we can see gorillas and, and their weapons and all in museums. But you know, regarding to safety, regarding to safety, um, there's the general knowledge because of the, of the media, you know, media, media usually focus on, on negative things. And, and this is not only here, this is all over the world. And of course, a lot of people have a lot of questions about safety and they have heard of the gangs and problems we have here. But when they actually see and they come and they say, well, yeah, there are problems, but they're really isolated communities. Only if you want to look for trouble, you will go and look for trouble. But if you stay in, in towns, you stay in national parks, it's completely safe. And um, they just recently discovered this with the surfing championship that they were here and the surfers were saying, you, you know, I've been completely safe here and moving around and visiting places and nothing has happened at all. So uh, it's relative, like any other country um, around the world, there are dangerous places and they are not to go areas. And this happens all over the world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm saying if you go now, if you go to Mexico now, I think for me it's impossible to go. They have so many kidnappings there. And I wanted to know if it was the same in El Salvador. We don't hear much, much about El Salvador. But mm -hmm. as you say, uh, it's the media, but it's exactly. safe. Yeah, yeah okay. it's, it is absolutely safe. It, and, and, the, the, and this is something like, for example, um, I... I get a lot of questions like in the in the in the email and my my answer is you know let's do a layover let's do some hours and then you decide if in the future you want to give us an opportunity and these two people stop here with a lot of questions and then we say don't worry you know it's safe we're going to go enjoy birding and once they were back to their countries and uh, well one of these one was a blogger and he was writing about a lot of people and inviting people to come to the country and say, you know, it's not like you hear in the news. It's an amazing place to go. It's there's an amazing place to bird, and it's, it's very safe and nice. That goes to my next question. Sorry to take over. Okay. Uh, just another one. Yes. Are there feeders? I get a lot of clients that want to photograph uh, hummingbirds, mm -hmm. especially. Are there feeders? Places with feeders? Well, as you you can imagine, this is just the, the beginning of of the. The activity here, so there are no many feeders. I just visit one who served in the mountains that has feeders for hummingbirds. The rest of them are have planted flowers, have planted uh, vegetation to attract the species, right? And but not feeders. But we are in the process of, you know, um, we are involved with my, my wife in designing one uh, guy for good practices on burden in, in this moment imagine we are in those steps with the ministry of environment and all these things are things that we we will take into consideration because we know that for especially for photography feeders are are important but so far we are working on that in uh, eventually in the we can find a balance because you know scientific are not really friend of feeders but they have to understand that also this is um, a balance point that we can find. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will. I was reading uh, one question about the numbers of species of the country. Yes. Um, uh, who posted it? Let's see. Ardi Shan of Cambodia. Yeah, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, the country, the country has a total, approximate total of 580 species, which a um, hundred and, well, my 200 are migratory species. And uh, from May to, sorry, from March to November, which is full of the locals, but then from November to March is full of uh, neotropical migrants. It's um, when birders come here and, and, and the few birds we have received and we go to the, to the forest here, they are just amazed of the quantity of species they can see from North America all together. Uh, species that are usually from the West Coast in the States or the East Coast in the States are usually together here in the same forest. 
And uh, it's so amazing for them because uh, they can see all kinds of warblers and tanayers that usually they will have to travel a lot in North America to, to spot. And here they're all together. They're just to just take a walk through the forest and they say, oh, wow, this is a Western tanayer. I have never seen that in the States because I live in the East Coast or the opposite way. Yeah, yeah that's a Tennessee warbler because I live in the West Coast, never seen it. So um, yeah, more or less 100, 580 species that we have in the country. All right, thank you. Uh, Kusum, yes. Kusum? Yep. Uh, hi, Julio. Thank you for the amazing uh, presentation. My pleasure. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, what are the other wildlife you get, like mammals, and uh, uh, do you get uh, endemic uh, mammals or uh, other wildlife? Mammals? Yeah, mammals, mammals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, it's um, usually we have, a, because of the nature of the territory, Central America, uh, <clears throat> we usually have a regional regional endemics in, in most of the cases like mammals, but we do have endemic species of other groups like, uh, for example, amphibians. We do have endemic species. We do have um, of these um, of kind, but in the case of mammals, we do get regional endemics, not really a country endemics. Like what? And uh, what, what kind of mammals? Some, some, some examples. Oh, okay. So we do have, for example, the Central America agouti. We have uh, we have some particular like, cotton tail mammals, uh, sorry, rabbits. We do have white tail uh, deer. We do have the arborean, um, which is this porcupine. We do get uh, coatis, um, and uh, they are actually easy to, to spot. We do have um, the nine-banded armadillos, uh, which is uh, from, from this area as well. But, you know, we have an, 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 an area here, which is near Monte Cristo Park, which is, it's called El Trifinio. El Trifinio is called because we, that park it's in three countries. We have it in Honduras, we have it in Guatemala, and we have it in El Salvador. It's huge. In our side, it's called Monte Cristo Park. In that area, we have a large concentration of these species because it's a very well protected area. And you can spot a lot of um, a, not only birds, but mammals and amphibians, reptiles in there. Okay, thank you. Is that all right with you, Kusum? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, any right. any primates uh, can be seen? Any? Primates? primates. Monkeys. 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 Oh. Yeah. monkeys. Well, monkeys are not really spread all over the country. We have a very small area in, uh, sadly, in the coast. In, in, in the past, there was a lot of deforestation because of uh, sugar cane and cotton farming. And so there's just a little forest in the corner, in the east south corner, where we have spider monkeys communities. And um, this is, is endangered considering in the territory, but easy to spot if you go to the right places. And there, there is even a group that has been so adapted to humans that they just come to you. If you have a banana, they will rob it from you and then they climb on you and then. But this is just one group that has adapted completely to humans. But yes, spider monkeys. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. Herbert. Yeah, Herbert, would you like to ask a question? Here, Herbert. Oh, okay. Herbert, yes, I had, a, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Julio, how are you? My, uh, very good. It's a pleasure to meet you. Greetings from Uganda. Uh, oh. Now, I was asking a question, do you have Bird Guides Club in, uh, in your country? Are there any women Bird Guides? Does the government support the development or training of Bird Guides and give them licenses? How do you do it in uh, El Salvador? 
Well, that's an amazing question. And then, and the answer is that is we are working on all that. It's just the beginning of the process. Um, general guides, um, national guides like me is specialized in burning. Probably we do have like a couple of them. Um, there are some girls that are, are not really guides or biologists that are starting to do some, some guiding. But the government, for, for the government, this is absolutely new. For, for the government, they don't really know anything about burden. Imagine that in this moment, we're just working with the Ministry of Environment, designing a, a guide for good practices of, of burden. So for the, it's, it's in the process, right? The ministry will probably soon realize the importance of all these, like you were mentioning, and they will do have to uh, start training, start uh, giving probably licenses. And this is all on the process. And we are seriously involved on, on this. And that nothing of this will be uh, important or, or have a, a success if we don't attract people to come. And this is very important because we can do all kinds of trainings for local guys. We can do all kind of <laughs> do, do things, but if, if tourists don't come and all these efforts are not really worthless, but if people get kind of frustrated, you know, because uh, um, they see, well, I'm trained, but where are the tourists? And, um, and this is something that I'm ready for. Uh, and, and that's why, for me, this campaign of education, this campaign of letting people know around the world about burning, and this is why some uh, global burning, uh, global big day, and global burning events are so important for me because it's like a, you know, display around the world. People turn their faces and says, "Wow, they saw 318 species in one day." So, in my case, for example, I already have circuits and tours, and if people well contact me and they say they want to go come burning here more than welcome more than welcome in, in in as more people come people will get more motivated and even the authorities will get start seeing that this is worth to do these processes thank you herbert for your question okay. thank you scott scott I thank you very much. Now, just a quick question. When people go there, where do they stay? I mean, in terms of the tourism development, like, is it hotels or lodges in the parks or, or where would they stay? Well, um, remember that we're talking about the beginning of burden as a touristic activity, but tourism has been long, long uh, here. So we, for example, we have a, a one uh, all-inclusive resort. We have hotels in small towns. We have all kinds of infrastructure. Our, our airport, for example, is one of the safest airport in, in, the, in the region. We have good weather in the airport most of the time. So the country is ready. The country is ready. There are tour, uh, tour companies not specialized in birding, but in all kinds of tours. There are hotels in mountains. There are hotels in the, in the beach. So it, the infrastructure is ready. The infrastructure oh. is ready. We just need to promote this as an activity to bring people. And uh, well, that's the point. Uh, to bring people that they come and they discover El Salvador as a birding destination. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gombo, I saw you raise your hand earlier. Do you still want to ask your question? Gombo, are you still there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm from uh, Mongolia. So, uh, thank you for, uh, for a very, very infor informative uh, presentation. Um, my question is, do you work with the, uh, with the scientists or, 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 you know, bird researchers for the conservation or protection of birds in your, your area? Well, uh, research is still still going on. Re research and, and um, when I when I described to you in the presentation that we have this as uh, almost exclusive scientific activity in the past, that doesn't mean that in the in the, in the present it still continues. Um, now it's a little different, right? Uh, citizen science has changed a little bit this, and uh, even though the scientists here in the South still doesn't get citizen science the right way. They now 
start understanding how people can actually help them. And um, I personally have been involved in, in discovering species in the country that were not registered here before. And, uh, and more birders that are not really scientists are doing the same, but still there we have universities, institutions, NGOs um, doing investigations, conservation, for example, for the yellow made parrots and uh, conservation for the parrots and parakeets in general. And um, now we have a, a campaign of uh, the wetlands, the mangroves, protecting the mangroves because of the species that are there. So yes, uh, research continues and uh, now they try to go a little bit with the hand with citizen science. Okay, thank you. And oh, wait, right. um, Mike, Mike is, uh, sorry, Gumbo. Oh, no, 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 I said, uh, uh, thank you very much for- uh, All right, thank you. My yeah, pleasure. Um, hey, yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike will ask a question from Facebook and then, yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, it's okay. actually my question. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for your inspiring and very informative presentation. No, um, thank you, Mike for your invitation and the opportunity to all of you guys. Uh, we are really thankful for, for the opportunity and uh, we're very happy to be here sharing with you. Okay. Well, we last met at the South America Bird Fair in Colombia with your wife, Claudia. Uh, yeah. I was, here in Asia, we have a lot of bird fairs or bird festivals, which we use to educate uh, the general public and especially school children. Uh, do you have any bird fairs in in your country or do you plan to start one <laughs> exactly <laughs> you read my mind you read my mind we um you know with with claudia and we had so many ideas uh, before the pandemia and uh we were really enthusiastic when we came from colombia we were just shocked and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, having those south and participants in the fair and seeing that many people in the buses in the mornings going everywhere, it, it was so inspiring. And 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 we recognize the importance there of you know education and not in bird fairs particular, right? So we had plans of all that, and but pandemia that came is you know and and changed everything, but. Um, we still have plans for this. Um, now that the authorities have gotten interested, um, we're planning to organize this, uh, starting probably with local festivals, uh, motivating people in, in particular areas that uh, have a lot of avifauna around to developing a, a local or even a regional bird fair because we have South American Bird Fair, we have American Birding Expo, we have the Asian Bird Fair, but we don't have a Central America, we have a Central America Bird Fair, right? Yes. So <laughs> definitely I can, oh. I can uh, probably abuse of your, your, your confidence, Mike, and we invite you to help us to organize it. And, and you know, all the people that we met there in, sure. uh, <laughs> in the fair, definitely. He's the man, yes. <laughs> it's the man and you know you don't, if, if you come Good to luck. Asia you know you, you will see even bigger affairs Peter I assure you you know it's one of the biggest okay well I plan definitely plan when, when possible and uh, I don't know when you guys are going to have it physically again I think 2022 probably yeah next I year I would probably Probably did the uh, the effort of going. Where where is this in this country? Where it's going it, to it be in Korea? Korea, okay. Yes, next year. Well, <laughs> let's start fingers planning fingers. and save you for that. <laughs> All right, Francisco. Uh, yes. What attracted tourists? Now I see that can be a good destination because you have uh, a road infrastructure that looks very nice, and there are many places to be discovered. Yes. Uh, before, uh, what attracted the tourists to El Salvador? Beach. Or what still attracts tourists to El Salvador? The that ocean. are not burning? Huh? The, the ocean. The ocean, the beaches, um, volcanoes. We have groups of people that come here. For example, uh, before the pandemic, we have a group that 
used to come from Europe to climb and to hike to the top of all the highest volcanoes there. We have amazing volcanic uh, territories. Um, the, the ocean, the, the Pacific Ocean here is so warm. There are, there are uh, beaches, for example, in the West. We have one of the few volcanic rocks reefs in, in America, you know, if Galapagos has one, El Salvador has another one. And when the tide goes out, those rocks volcanic get hot. So when the ocean comes back and you swim at the ocean in the afternoon or wow. whatever the tide is back, the ocean is probably 26 Celsius. So it's like being in a hot tub in the ocean. So all these, um, and besides that, the culture, you know, the, the food, the food here is amazing. I would say, you know, we have amazing birds, but I always, all these years working in tourism, uh, I really proud of my people. I, I, I really love my people and they, they know whatever I go, I see smiles, wherever you go, you see smiles. It doesn't matter why you see smiles and, and people, it's just happy, you know? And, um, and that's what people feel so welcome and warm and, and they love it. You know, and the easiness, the easiness to move. You can be in San Salvador and from San Salvador, you can move easily to, in less than two hours, you are anywhere in the country with all these good roads and you have amazing uh, hotels. So all that is attractive to, to tourists. And uh, well, lately, last week that we had this surfing uh, championship, people were looking at the country as a surfing destination, of course. But they, all this has attracted um, tourists in the past, and uh, hopefully in, in this in this new age, we will do attract people through birding. And, and you said more than three hundred species in one day. You well, get... in one day, in one day, if you plan a route, in one day you can probably see a hundred and. 50 species if you Amazing. plan in one day in, two, in 24 Amazing. hours okay. um the maximum i have done i think it's like 135 in one day and it was it was just places that the tourists wanted to see but if if we have the objective of seeing that many species if you plan it correctly you can be sleeping in the highest point of the country and then get the road all the way to the ocean and easily you see 150 species in one day Okay. Right, Great. ladies and gentlemen, time for group photo. Oh, yeah. Time to open your camera. <laughs> yes. Turn your camera now to Zoom. Richard. Hello, Richard. Combo, yeah. Hi, Bogan. Bogan, are you still with us? Bogan. I know Bogan is from Mongolia. Hi, Victor. Can I ask one question? Okay, Thomas here. Julia, yeah, of course. Yes. I see a couple of pictures of trogons you know, in your presentation. Yeah. They are forest birds. Are they easy to see? Yes. Yes, they are easy to see. Um, got the trogons, mm -hmm. uh, black headed trogons, uh, elegant trogons are very, very common in the right, in the right places. Uh, these are uh, birds related to quetzals, right? So in, in, if you go higher, you can go the colored trogon and uh, not complicated to see. They are not complicated to see. Not even, you don't even need to use playback for seeing them. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go Take back to group photo. Yes, yes. Okay. Now look at the camera and smile and don't move. One, two, three. Thank you very much. All right, are there more questions? Let's take one last question. Oh, okay. Is there? All right, before we ask the one last question, Mike, just tell us where are we going next week? Because next week is gonna be our last episode, right? Yeah. Next week is our last episode, and we're going to we're going to southern South America to Argentina with Horacio Matarazzo. Argentina, Horacio. great, that's great. Look forward to Horacio's 
presentation. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, Julio. It's a great presentation. We learned a lot from, from you, El Salvador. We learn a lot from you, actually. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, um, and thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, hopefully, in the near future, I will see all of you here. You're welcome to my house. You don't need hotels. We have a couple of hotels here. Thank you, Julio. You see you very soon. My Ca pleasure. Careful what you ask for. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Not all at the same time. Not all at the same time. I'm, 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 I'm a big room. So, hope to thank see you, you guys much. next Saturday. Yes, see next you next Friday. week. Thank you. Hey, good yes, night, please. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you in Uganda soon. I'm enjoying it. Uganda. This. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.